So the very first thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a brief history of the Jenkins UI that is going to be profoundly informative for all of you to kind of set the context uh, for what we're up to. Um, then uh, uh, Tom's going to tell you a little bit about um, what he's been doing in the UI so far and about some of the lessons that, that he's learned. And um, uh, then he's going to move on to show you some of the improvements that he's made um, and some new facets and themes and styleability for the Jenkins UI. Um, and then I'm going to follow that up uh, showing a proof of concept uh, demo of the GUI. So uh, um, uh, you all have a chance to see what we're thinking about um, for the next version. And uh, um, if there's anything that I want you guys to all take away from this, you know, despite the sort of ridiculousness of a PowerPoint presentation and coming to talk to you all in this sort of venue, um, that the UI is actually profoundly important, uh, especially to me, um, also to Tom, definitely to CloudBees, the company. And my hope is that for some of you all here as well, that it's important. Um, I see it as uh, really the gateway uh, entrance point to the product. Um, so, uh, uh, so let me uh, put this in context with that, that history I was promising. Okay, so like any good timeline, this one starts with the, really the beginning of recorded history. In uh, 40,000 BCE, we had our first cave paintings. And uh, uh, it wasn't long after that that a uh, um, man discovered that there were bugs in software. Um, so shortly thereafter, KK uh, invented Hudson to help address some of that problems. And really, the brilliance of Hudson, although you can see it, it has a UI, which was super duper important, obviously. Um, uh, the real importance of it was the community aspect behind it. Um, so what made Hudson different from other products of its sort in the day was that people could contribute. So again, part of the reason why I'm out here and uh, Tom's out here and we're going to pitch this really hard is we're hoping to engage you all um, uh, and your, your brain muscles in what the Jenkins UI should be like. Um, we're going to show you what we hope is a compelling demonstration of what it can be like, and we're eager to get y'all's feedback about what you think, what you like, what you don't like, because uh, the Jenkins community is, above all things, an inclusive community. Okay, so then in 2011, we had the great schism, Hudson and Jenkins. Um, you can see there was a, a fairly significant UI change. The butler looks di different, a little better maybe. Um, and now we have modern times, and this is uh, uh, where Tom and I come in, and we're going to start showing you what's going on with these pieces. All right, so early progress. I'm going to hand this over to Tom. So um, as I said, over the last year, I've been doing bits of work on the Jenkins UI. Um, so the, mostly the, what we're talking about in the recent past has been uh, kind of refreshing the look and feel of Jenkins. So um, just listen to some of the things. We've done a good few things, but, but kind of the, the highlights, I guess, would have been the replacing of the, the table-based layout with div-based layout, so, which allowed us basically to do responsive, make the UI more responsive. So um, uh, on different types of devices and stuff like that, uh, the layout kind of adjusts itself more appropriately for that device. Um, also did some other things, including CSS-based um, uh, icons as opposed to the old image-based icons. And the reason why I'm listing that here is because it's relevant to the demo we're going to do in a little while. But I suppose importantly as well, one of the things we try to do is not disrupt the current set of plugins or make them unusable in any way. So uh, if we did do that, we're not, not aware of it and let us know. Um, but I, I think the most important thing that um, we got from the exercise over the last year were the things we did, that we learned in terms of what what's wrong with Jenkins UI and the sort of improvements that we need to make to it, to Jenkins core in order to make um, more profound uh, improvements to the UI and the user experience in Jenkins. Um, so basically, what did we learn? So did, I'm going to list, basically list a few things here that uh, areas where we think we, if, if we make improvements in the Jenkins UI, we can then make major improvements in terms of the user experience in Jenkins. So one of the first things we're going to talk about is uh, CSS and how modularization of CSS is a problem at the moment. So basically, there is no real modularization of the CSS. So we think if we, if we can fix that, uh, we can make some major improvements um, in the UI and add some, some new, pretty cool new features. Uh, this is something I'm going to talk about in more detail now in a few minutes. Um, another pr problem, and people are, I think are very aware of this, maybe not, might not be aware of the cause, I guess, but. Uh, everyone's aware of the fact that the configuration page, pages within Jenkins are pretty 
a painful experience sometimes, especially if you've got lots of plugins installed and stuff like that. And the main reason for that is, is basically how the page is laid out in terms of the, the, the semantic layout of the page. It's kind of hard to in, infer things about the layout and, and make adjustments to it. This is something that Gus is going to go into detail in, in his part of the talk. And uh, he's got a really cool demo on that part of that. And then finally, hopefully, we'll get to talk a bit about how modularization with a, of, of the JavaScript within uh, Jenkins UI is um, not exactly what it should be at the moment. There's no real modularization. So if, if you know the core of Jenkins, you know that most of the JavaScript is in files like Hudson Behavior and that, and it's basically like a, a dog's dinner of, of JavaScript. There's all sorts of stuff thrown in there. Okay, so. Um, So basically, we reckon if we can if we can sort out some of these problems in, in a meaningful way, we'll be able to start doing kind of new approaches to to uh, UI development in Jenkins. And if the in terms of modularizing CSS, so that was the first thing I had on the list there. Um, one approach that we've been looking at recently and have had some success with is using less. So less is basically a CSS preprocessor. I'm not sure if people are aware of it or not, but um, Basically, what, what it will, one of the things less will allow us to do, it allows us to do a number of things, but, but the first and probably most important part about it is that it allows us to actually modularize the CSS. So rather than having one big CSS with, with, all, of, with, with, with all the style in there, we can basically break it out into more logical um, CSS components. Second thing that CSS allows us to do is parameterization of the CSS. So if you look in, in the CSS in Jenkins at the moment, there's there are different types of things like colors and different background colors, border um, parameters and stuff like that, border widths, border radiuses, all sorts of things, background colors and stuff that are kind of all over the place in the CSS. What less allow, would allow us to do is actually kind of centralize those in one place um, and kind of have a con more consistent um, look and feel in terms of the, the CSS properties on the pages so the, 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 the variables can be used instead of the actual raw colors. And then thirdly, and importantly for, for us, I think what, what less will allow us to do is actually namespace the CSS. So what that means then is we can start making use of some really useful uh, CSS libraries out there like Bootstrap and jQuery UI and to be able to use them in a safe way such that the CSS rules don't conflict with each other and stuff like that. Okay, so there are some of the benefits of CSS. But the, uh, those three benefits in themselves are, while they're very useful, um, as far as I'm concerned, I think one of the most, most important things about modularizing the CSS will be the, the fact that it will allow us to introduce new kind of ideas into Jenkins. Um, and the main one being, at the moment, that I, we can see is the idea of user interface teams. And we think CSS modularization will be a very important part of that. So basically what we're talking about there with UI teams is the idea of basically allowing the user to customize kind of style and behavioral characteristics of the UI um, and to do that on a per login basis. So instead of everybody that on a Jenkins instance having the same user interface, that basically we allow them to actually each user to customize the interface in a way that suits them. So basically like kind of stylistic things like changing the headers and, and uh, icons and stuff like that. But also if you have a preference in terms of how you want the, mail, the, the, the layout of the menus to look, you can tweak them for your login, change the status balls, stuff like that. Like we should be able to do this kind of thing with, with uh, uh, user UI teams and CSS would be an important part of that. But um, it's not just kind of eye candy stuff that this is important, it's not just for that reason that it's important. In terms of solving, solving kind of important usability issues, UI teams think are, are, can play a very important role. So like for, for people with color blindness or other uh, visual impairments, we can, they, they will be able to actually customize the UI to suit them. Okay, so at this stage I'm gonna do a little demo. So I actually have a quick question for, for all y'all out here. Uh, how many of you all uh, make plugins? So, so a few, okay. And use plugins, are there a lot of you that use plugins? Pretty much everybody uses some set of plugins. How about folders, is there a good set of you guys that use folders? When you use folders, you use them extensively. Okay, awesome. That's just for my benefit, not, not for yours. I don't even think I can just work through it. Yeah, yeah. That, that was just for me. 
Yeah, so some, a while ago actually, it's a, probably two or three months ago at this stage, I started playing around with this idea of using less to modularize the CSS and Jenkins, and I started building some components, components around that. Uh, so there's a UI Teams plugin, and then there's some other com components that get built into, need to get built into Jenkins Core. Now this isn't in Jenkins Core today, but I've got a Jenkins instance <coughs> running here with it in it. Okay, so I've got two, two browsers, okay? Now I've logged in, so I'm gonna log in two different users. First one is gonna be myself. As you can see, the, Jen the instance here, by default, looks, basically looks the same as Jenkins at the moment, even though the teams are running um, underneath. Sorry. Where is your... Sorry. Let's get this up again. Huh? Okay, now we got it. So I've got two logins here, one from myself, and then another account here with Gus, okay? Um, so as you can see, they're both the same style, both the same layout, so they're um, not much to see there. But what, when I actually go into the, act, uh, the user account, I have this icon here on the left-hand side, UI Teams. And what it allows me to do, it brings up the UI team configuration for that user. So by default, the user has, uh, we've, uh, what I've done is extracted a number of different types of teams out of the, the style that CSS into modules of their own and created actual teams, okay? So at the, at the top here, you can see on the tabs, you can see the different teams that I've got at the moment, but you, we could extract a lot more. So there's page header, icons, status balls, console output. And then along on the left-hand side there, in each case, what we've got is an implementation, different implementations of each of those teams. And the idea is that you can contribute, people can actually create new implementations of different teams and um, so that users can actually start using them. So in the case of install, install a different plugin or whatever for a different icon set, and uh, you can start using those icons. Okay, so for my account here, what I'll do is, um, I'll change the icons to use font awesome icons. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, of font awesome, icon, uh, font awesome icons. But what you can see here is on the left is that when I change that, the, the icons automatically change. And this is going back to what I was saying earlier about CSS, changing the, the icons in Jen Jenkins from using images to CSS is something we did earlier in the year. So that, that change has made this particular thing possible. So if you actually look at the source there now, instead of an image, what you actually get to see is just a, a simple uh, span element that gets styled. So when we change the, the team, the, the, the span element gets styled differently. Okay, so the, that's the icons there. And I'll change the status ball. So you know the, the build status um, indicators, classic indicators are the, the icons that you're all used to, the, the little bouncing animated GIFs. So if I change those, we, I, I created a, an, another implementation of the status balls um, team, which is, using uh, CSS animations. So basically, it's not using images at all, it's just using the browser itself to, to animate the um, animated div. Okay, so I'm gonna change my um, status balls to use CSS tree animations. Now if we go over to, so if I go to the main page now, you can see how the look and feel is a little bit different. But as you imagine, if you did put, if we put more work in this, we can, into this, we can do a lot more radical things as well. But this is, like, this is just a small bit of work and we've kind of been able to make different changes. So for a colorblind person, for example, they could actually change their, their um, status ball to be something different for if, it, if blue is the, or sorry, if green is not a color that, that suits those, so. Yeah, so, so as Tom's saying, I think the value here is really uh, sort of, well, really threefold. So uh, one is, um, with this sort of mechanism, you know, it's possible to package up themes that are pre canned so you wouldn't have to necessarily take the time to configure it all yourself. Um, so that's one big benefit. Another big benefit is uh, for uh, those who have very specific usability needs, the UI itself doesn't need to sync to that common denominator. Um, and, and finally, um, this is setting up uh, really the groundwork um, for uh, potentially much more significant UI changes that, uh, than Jenkins has seen so far. So, uh, um, uh, you know, having yeah. these pillars in place provides a good foundation to put a variety of new wrappers on top. 
Right, yeah. So, like, CSS would just be one part of UI teams as I see it. Like, I think it, we can start doing other things as well that will, would allow different types of behaviors, like with the, with the menus and stuff that make them collapsible and make things visible or not visible depending on, I mean, if you're not interested in having build queue status and stuff in, in your navigation here, that you should be able to just check box that them in or out kind of a thing. So, I'll just continue anyway, and on my account here, I'll change my team to look slightly different. And I'll give it, use this light team here. So it's basically just, and it, as you can see, all of the teams here have different um, options here that you can configure. So this goes back to the using less and the parameterization value in less. So what we've done here is expose the number of um, parameters in those, in those teams and made them configurable to the user. So the user can change the image on the, t on the top there, for example, or the background color themselves, or just pick the, the light team. So I'm going to just pick that and then, so pretend I've got visual impairment. So green doesn't work for me. I'm going to change the status the balls to be blue for success. Just change this red here in some way. Apply that. And then again, change this as well. So I'll use the, the console output. I'll change that to be a dark. So some people like dark as opposed to white. Let's change that. So when I go back here now, you can see my login. So I refresh the page. Looks different than Gus's. OK, we can kick off a build here now and just see what happens when with the animations. Oops, sorry. Okay, we can go into the build here, for example. I think this is the one. So just the main takeaway is that by modularizing the, the CSS and parameterizing them and stuff like that, we can we kind of were able to build features on top of that that make it kind of easier to pull out the kind of the, the behavior, different behaviors and make them easier for users to configure. That's probably the main takeaway there. All righty, so if I'm sitting down here, uh, can you still hear me okay through this mic? Okay, good. So, uh, um, all right, we're gonna blast through this. Um, so, all right, so uh, the work that Tom showed you, as I mentioned, the important aspect of it is it really sets the table, um, sets down a framework that we can build on to potentially dramatically affect the polish of uh, the Jenkins UI. Um, you know, Tom, Tom showed that we can surface some of these decisions into the GUI itself so that you as an end user could tweak it without necessarily writing your own code or plugin or anything. But on top of that, we as CloudBees engineers can, can equip the Jenkins experience with something that's a little bit more higher polish and professional um, than, than maybe Jenkins has been to date. So, um, so the beginning here, this is what the, the intro screen to Jenkins could look like. Um, it's just a little spit and polish. Not a, not a huge amount to it, but the idea is to make it clear what the very first action is. So the very first action here is creating an item. Um, normally what you would do is use this plus, so that's all explained here without a lot of distraction. All right, so creating an item. Um, let's uh, page up here a little bit. Okay, so um, if you have a lot of plugins in Jenkins, you may uh, know that in your first section where you choose the type of item you want to create, it doesn't take all that many plugins for this to become sort of a toilet paper list polluted with every other plugin that you may have installed that has its own special item to create. So this guy can get to be incredibly long and difficult to manage. But as part of the Jenkins community, we want to encourage plugging growth. And we want people to go and add a new kind of item that can be created. So we don't want to have any kind of limit on that. So the solution is really to come up with some sort of categorization for them, right? So uh, if the types of items have some sort of category, then you can put them in some kind of box, and then you can easily scan and find the category that you care about without wading through, like I said, a giant toilet paper list of, of items. So um, to make up for the fact that the comments are gone, so now I have the comments coming back in hover. Um, and uh, one of the things that we'd like to keep getting feedback from you guys is, um, is this the right form factor for, for displaying these categories? Um, you know, that's well open for the debate, really easy to change. The names of the categories easy to change. Should they disappear if there's no items in them? 
all these kinds of questions are questions that come out in discussions with, with real users like you. So what I'm putting together here is just a guess. So I'm saying I, I think this is better and interesting and shows my point. But for all these things, what I really want is we'll put up places where you can see and interact with the UI. And I, I want your feedback. I want you to tell me, no, Gus, that was really stupid. Don't do it the dumb way. Do it the good way. So Gus test. Okay, so let's create this guy. All right. No module given. So let's do it correctly. So uh, just for the record, there are going to be some bugs in this. This is a, um, actually running on top of real Jenkins. But it's not really done code. It's just code for the demo. Um, uh, so I am, and I, in fact, I'm going to very specifically show you some bugs kind of on purpose so that you'll know some of the areas that we're navigating around. Um, if you are a plugin creator, you probably care very greatly about this configuration form that I'm showing now because your plugin probably interacts with it, and you probably had to think <laughs> about how these form controls work and which ones you were going to choose. And here I am potentially changing them. So again, if you are a plugin developer, we definitely want to hear from you. We want to get your feedback on what kind of form controls you wish were in Jenkins. And uh, uh, we want to have your feedback about how you feel your plugin may or may not be affected by some of these potential changes. All right, so this should start to look fairly familiar, um, but with the big difference that I've taken these guys and I've blocked them in, again into clear categories and sections. So Jenkins already has the notion of categories for these items, but if you look at uh, Jenkins today, um, there's no real clear visible divide between the sections. Again, this becomes really kind of a homogenous toilet paper list of, of items in which it's really hard to tell which are the important ones and which ones are just generic items. So here, um, some of these will also be generic items. Obviously, they have to follow to some degree the same form factor, but these guys are minimal, minimalizable. So as you go through, you can put away the pieces that you don't want. Um, so here we are to one of the more important pieces, what kind of source uh, control management are you going to use? So as you probably also know in the Jenkins UI, uh, these components are potentially nestable. So, uh, um, uh, and sometimes in the current Jenkins UI, it's a little bit difficult to tell what is nested within what. Um, it's all white. They're all kind of, again, same heading level. So here we have really a clear differentiation of the nesting. Um, so, uh, 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 and again, this is, this is actually the Jenkins <coughs> configuration page. So the same metadata that is in Jenkins today is what's manufactured this page. Um, so the, the raw materials are all there to break out that information a little bit more cleanly. Um, so get is a little bit more popular these days. So here's what the get guy looks like. Um, and already this is a significant amount, I think. I mean, I made it, so obviously I love it. But it's, uh, I think, a significant improvement over uh, where we are today. Um, the hetero list control is another important guy. Um, and it's the control here that's with build steps. Um, so one of the things that sort of bugs me about this guy is it doesn't quite have the prominence that it deserves. Right? Your build step is probably the most important piece of your configuration in most cases, especially in a freestyle build. And this guy doesn't have a lot of emphasis. So one of the easy things I did is just let you know that it's here even when there's nobody in it. So it still occupies some visual space. Um, but to show that these guys are nestable, um, so you can pop in a guy, um, and he's in there. He still has the same draggable mechanism. Um, and we can add as many steps as we want. And uh, uh, they're going to continue to nest and be draggable, um, just like you want. Um, but Again, with, with some visual differentiation, not just to make it look nice, although that is important to me as, a, you know, as an art school reject, um, but uh, uh, to make it actually more, more usable. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and save this, and you're going to get to see one of my many bugs. Okay, so um, one of the hard things about this configuration page is the JavaScript that assembles um, the object, the JSON object that describes the thing that you submitted. It's a little bit of technical mumbo jumbo, but, but this ties back in directly to what Tom was saying. Um, the JavaScript libraries that are used now to assemble the Jenkins UI do some kind of crazy, wacky stuff. Um, so, uh, so I need basically Tom and, and people like Tom to help me get in there and uh, uh, straighten these pieces out and uh, 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 make it so that this, this submit object actually works correctly and, and you get what you want. But regardless, um, this did in fact uh, create the job so we can look at it. Okay, so um, you may have noticed that uh, uh, some things are missing from the uh, Jenkins console UI here. 
um, and there's some new colory buttons instead. Um, so, uh, so this is this is again this is somewhat of an ask to you all. This is a concept that I, that I'm going to put forward um, that I don't know for sure that, that I have the right answer, but uh, I think this is a step in the right direction, and eventually I'm, I'm going to be looking for feedback from the community about. Um, so I have this belief that some of the widgets in Jenkins are better contextual, and some of the widgets in Jenkins are better as a sort of global <coughs> system entity. So what do I mean by that? So if you look at the Jenkins dashboard today, right, first off, you have this actions menu here. And, and bleeding directly into it, these are, are what's called widgets in Jenkins land down here. Um, so in my use of Jenkins anyway, this build queue, this widget, this is important to me regardless of where I am in the product. You know, I want to see the build that's coming next um, because I may be caring about an upstream build or a downstream build. And when I go navigate somewhere, I still want to follow the build that I was watching before. I don't want this guy to change in any way. But today in the Jenkins UI, especially if you're using folders, as you navigate into the folders, the context of what's showing up in the queue is dependent on the folder. So as soon as you navigate into a folder, this guy will change. Um, if you don't use a lot of folders, you may not have noticed that. Um, Maybe you noticed it, but you didn't really notice why. Suddenly the thing you were watching is gone. That's a usability faux pas in my mind. So, um, so this is what I mean by something that might be better as a global widget. These actions here, because they are all contextual, just as a, a fact of Jenkins, this is again maybe something that you've noticed, maybe something that you haven't. Um, again, depending on how much you use folders. These actions, it needs to be clear that they are going to take effect on the particular item that you're looking at, not in the global context. So what have I done? Um, okay, so uh, here, first off, the create button, I'm, I'm saying this is a global context. From anywhere, you should be able to hit the create button. Um, for the build queue, you should be able to see the build queue wherever you are. And you should be able to choose whether you're using that in the context of a particular folder. But by default, you should see the build queue everywhere, right? So that you, when you navigate around, you don't actually lose track of the build that you happen to be following. Right, so, uh, uh, so that's what I'm doing here. And I, I suspect that there's a couple of other elements that would fit this notion of a global context. An easy one is just navigating the Jenkins system settings. There's really no reason why you should have to navigate away from your build configuration or whatever you're looking at to go and change some specific setting within Jenkins. You should be able to do that immediately. So if you're looking at this thing and you're like, oh crap, I forgot to add plugin X, Y, or Z, you know, it should be a click away. Um, you know, ideally, you wouldn't even lose this context on the page change, but you know, we're going we're gonna to walk first. Um, some other suggestions here might be the support bundling widget. So Cloud, part of CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise is a support bundle, so you can check things that you want to send off to tell the support people what problems you're having. That would probably make sense as a global context. Um, documentation might make sense. This guy here, this guy's meant to be fingerprints. Um, I haven't finished all my homework. Sorry, teacher. Um, some of these pieces don't actually work yet, but that's, that's the idea here. That's the concept. Okay, so then on the other side, we have the traditional Jenkins actions. Um, so these guys, I've moved them over to the right, and I, in general, I view this as a UI faux pas, right? These things used to be on the left, and now here's this art student coming along, suddenly putting them on the right. Um, normally, I would not like to do that. I know it, it's shameful, um, but the reason why I'm suggesting it is because I do think it's important, especially in the case of new adoption, to have a uniform context for what you're going to put on the left versus what you're going to put on the right. So since I've introduced this notion of a global context, to me, global context makes sense to be on the left. You come from the broad view of the world, you move to the narrow view on the right. Um, so that's my sort of justification for actions on the right versus on the left. Um, and then also just a matter of screen real estate. You know, I want to be able to fit all of these guys on potentially at once. And I don't want menus clobbering menus. Um, so uh, despite the fact that I know it's a usability faux pas to just up and move a critical piece of functionality to the other side of the page, um, I'm suggesting it here anyway for those reasons. So then again, this is a spot where I'm really hoping um, you all might have some time to, to experiment with the pieces. We're going to try to get them out somewhere where they can be experimented with. Mm -hmm. And you can tell me, oh my god, Gus, it's so annoying. I keep trying to click the action button and you went and you moved it to the other side, I hate you forever. Like, yes, that'll make my inner child cry, 
but it, uh, it's important for me to know, and I'd much rather know it early, um, so that I uh, so that I can juggle that in with the other factors that we're considering. Okay. I think that kind of ties back as well to the UI teams. Like so, some of this, these behavioral things, if you're not, I mean, you should, they should be configurable. Like, and it should be an option that people go in. I, I prefer the other way around. My global is on the right, and, and local is on the left. And it should be just a case that for your login, you can switch it to the other side if you want. But um, that's. Our, our mutual boss has been using the, the sort of catchphrase um, perspectives, 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 perspectives um, uh, similar to what Eclipse has. Um, uh, I don't usually think of Eclipse as like my favorite UI, an example of good UI, but uh, um, but there is something clever about the way you can sort of define a workspace, and I don't think that's actually unique to Eclipse. Eclipse just happens to call them. Yeah, or views, whatever. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so that's the, the gist of these core set of changes. Um, uh, in addition, you may have noticed that I haven't really done anything to this central table here. Um, so that's another bit of homework um, that I'm still chewing on, and is a little bit potentially maybe a little bit controversial. Um, so in in Jenkins today, by and large, what you're navigating are build configurations, especially if you're using folders build configurations in folders. And your primary axis of view on the world is this, I'm navigating in and out of these folders, and I see this list of configurations, and these sort of configuration objects. You know, sometimes there are other things in there as well. Um, you know, like if you're using JOC, there's update centers and masters, and some other different kinds of elements might also appear in your folders. Your security context is a big thing that might be related to your folders. But your axis of viewing the world is very related really to this URL bar. It's really not even the, the folder so much as um, that path that you happen to be looking at. So um, for jobs, I think that works OK, um, but there are certainly some limitations. You might, for example, want to be looking and sorting your, uh, all your build jobs that are related to a particular project but are failing. Or maybe you want to um, uh, look at all your build jobs that were last touched by, you know, unreliable Gus, um, who's probably broken something. So maybe you want to sort them by last submit, and also by project. You know, you only care about the alpha beta project, and you care, you know, what did Gus do last Tuesday because he probably broke it. So it would be nice if you could sort and group items by that criteria rather than climbing in and out of folders or trying to have created your folders ahead of time to enable the right view, or if you had. Um, or if you are using views, rather than trying to do something sort of programmatic to pre-set up all these conditions, it'd be nice if you had basically a basic pivot chart. So um, one of the things that we're working on at CloudBees is, uh, is Docker traceability, and I, I think this is sort of a poster child feature for this, this kind of mechanism. Okay, so in Docker traceability, this feature really cares primarily about Docker containers, not about build job configurations. So if you're looking for the container that um, came from the uh, Ubuntu image that just had a security patch, as an example. Um, you may, and you want to find all of those that came from that same master image, they may or may not all be in the same project. They may or may not all be in the same folder. And, and even still, you know, where are my Docker images going to be shown? Would that even make sense for them to be in a folder? I, I, I'm kind of not convinced by that. So the kind of view that we, I would want us to be able to construct is just going to list the containers by their name and by their relevant attributes. And their attributes ought to be able to be arbitrary. So just because something is a particular project doesn't necessarily dictate what folder it's in. Maybe your folders are all based on security context, but you have QA people and engineers, and they are working on the same project, but they have very different security contexts. So if you're basing everything on folders, you have a real problem there because it's impossible to be in two separate folders at the same time. Really the best thing you can do is come up with shortcuts. So if instead these are arbitrary properties of these objects, then you can sort and group by them. So uh, as an example um, here, you might say, well show me the ones that are recent, right? So I've got guys that are long ago, I don't care about them. This month, you can see my data set is a little bit stale, so I really only have guys that are kind of old. Um, but I can group them, close out the section that I don't want, and then subsort them um, uh, by state, right? Or any of these criteria. Um, and what that, that's really letting you do is um, get a matrix 
a multi-dimensional search, effectively, or a multi-dimensional filter of the items that you care about. And if those are not based on folders, but instead based on arbitrary properties of the items, um, this becomes actually a powerful research tool rather than just a convenient way to have your configuration items hang out. Collapse That would be a good addition. I don't have a collapse all, so I can't show it, I guess, obviously, but I would like to be able to. That's a, that's a good idea. Um, uh, and I have, a, I have a filter here. My filter only works so-so at the moment. You should be able to filter by any property, including properties that are potentially not those being displayed in the grid. Um, at the moment, all I can really do is name, so I can do AI, SH. Do you get the idea? Filtering. I don't claim this to be a new invention. Groupable tables didn't invent that. Um, uh, my big contribution is um, I think Jenkins can benefit from it. Um, and in fact, just the idea of sorting and grouping on multiple dimensions um, could potentially be other form factors as well. Some things will make sense as a grid, but um, you know, maybe if these are artifacts, maybe you, you care so much about the artifact state that uh, um, you don't actually want to see it as a grid, but instead you want to see it as some sort of progression. You know, there, there might be a handful of other visualizations that might make sense, but the first step is to be able to sort and group the entirety of items based on uh, arbitrary attributes of those items. So this is, this is far and away the most future-related thing that, that I'm showing, and to some degree why it's not incorporated into the demo. If you think about that and what's entailed in that, there's a uh, sort of a significant level of uh, back-end stuff that would, would have to happen to enable a performant search sort and group. Um, but, uh, uh, but I think that's the right direction for the UI, and uh, uh, y'all's enthusiasm about that kind of thing is the kind of thing that will sort of, sort of help make it happen. So, uh, um, so that's what I've got for the sort of uh, demo, demo stuff. Um, and Tom's got a little bit more to show you about the JavaScript modularization and a little bit more details yep. about how that works. Right. So the last um, part of the talk, I guess, so is the uh, idea of or is solving the actual JavaScript modularization problem. So, as Anyone that's worked in Jenkins core knows that, uh, that as I said earlier, the, the JavaScript is in general totally unmodularized. Everything is thrown into a small handful of JavaScript files. So um, sorting that out is going to uh, will make a lot of things a lot easier. Okay. So uh, also we use a number of um, kind of third-party frameworks for uh, like like some prototype JS and jQuery. And at the moment they're just glommed into the uh, global namespace, which is not a good idea. So fixing that problem is another thing that we think is pretty high on the list of priorities. And uh, I guess the main reason why some of these things happened is that there was no kind of real established um, patterns or tools in terms of uh, doing JavaScript modularization, modularizing, modularizing the JavaScript. And so one of the things we've been doing in a couple of places in, um, in Jenkins, both in Jenkins Enterprise and in, also in the UI Teams plugin, I use it again here, is the idea, um, is the following idea, basically using Node.js modules. So basically taking the JavaScript, rather than putting the JavaScript in one big JavaScript file and doing your best to kind of make it look modular within that file itself, and then using adjuncts and stuff to uh, load it up in, 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 uh, on your web page in Jenkins. So what we do is basically use, follow the Node.js um, pattern and build modules that way. So common JS type modules, and then use a tool called Browserify, which is um, a very nifty little tool out there. It's a Node.js program that basically allows you to take Node.js modules and process them into a single bundle that can then be loaded up in your browser. Okay, so you've, that's a build time tool. So you get the benefit of the modularization, but also uh, at runtime, it's not a whole load of modules in the browser uh, loaded separately. Okay, so. Um, that gets processed. So, so building that then into your plugin, um, how do you actually accommodate that in your plugin? So there's a, another, another Node.js program out there basically for building applications like this, and it's called Gulp. And basically what it allows you, to, it's kind of like Maven for JavaScript, if you like. It's for building um, Node.js type applications, okay? And then we wire that into the actual, you can wire that into your plugin using uh, a Maven um, plugin called front end. Maven plugin, okay? So it's a pretty easy process to do and it ends up, you end up with a, a, nice, more, a nicer and more modular uh, JavaScript that's e easier to maintain. 
Okay, and then you, you also get the benefit, of course, of being able to use loads of different uh, Node.js um, frameworks out there and get the benefit of like Moment.js and stuff like that. Um, so just to give you a quick look at that, I'm not going to go into this in detail, just other than to just show you what that looks like in the UI Teams module itself. Okay, so the fact that we've gone down a modular route as well then means we can start introducing our own like utility frameworks and stuff like that. So in this case, um, we've got we, we kind of created a really lightweight MVC framework. Or it's more like an MVC pattern really that we follow for building stuff like this, and we did the same in, in the enterprise workflow extensions that CloudBees provide. Uh, so in the UI teams, then basically at the top, we can require this Jenkins JS MVC module, and uh, just this just ends up looking like bog standard Node.js um, code. Okay, so it's. And you can see the way we can separate out and modularize the actual JavaScript into model controller, model view controller type uh, modules. And we're using things like um, handlebars templates. We're doing the templating. So basically, we're doing client side templating and using a REST API then that just makes REST calls uh, to the back end to Jenkins to get the data that it needs and applying templates on the client side. So that's the kind of pattern that we're going with it in, a, in a number of places to solve the kind of uh, modularization issues. So there's two minutes, three minutes left there now, if anyone, if there are any questions? I want to go to the speaker, maybe it's the easier for other people to hear. Um, how are the, uh, the user themes stored? So does that require like a database backend or are those stored flat files? That can be Same as everything else in Jenkins. Yeah, it's stored within the users, um, users on the disk as part of the user's path, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, so you, uh, you were showing that there was uh, the buns on the left side and the buns on the right side, uh, but that was in the, um, in the Jenkins Enterprise. Uh, is that something that you're contributing back to open source Jenkins or is that just for Jenkins Enterprise? Um, yeah, so uh, that's a, to some degree a decision uh, above my pay scale. Um, so certainly some significant portions will need to come back to the, to the open source. And we'll need to probably even start in the open source because the hooks all need to be in core Jenkins. In core Jenkins. Um, then beyond that, the specifics of you know, what the style patterns are and, and um, you know, what the bevels are on the buttons, you know, the sort of artsy pieces, um, you know, that, CloudBees is going to have to decide where they want to put their stamp on it. But lobby KK. KK actually, I don't know if you know this, but he carries a lot of weight in the, uh, in the CloudBees organization. <laughs> and in Jenkins. And in Jenkins community yeah. too, yeah. But most of it ha has to go into Jenkins core. Like it just can't work otherwise. Cool. And it makes sense anyway. I think it's a good community thing to do. Great, thanks. My question is about the uh, one of the area where probably it's very monolithic and uh, is the console output. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how you can make it uh, more easy to navigate and easy to troubleshoot because rather than looking at one monolithic file, in context to how you provision it, or what are the steps are within your job, or especially in, right. in like workflow, there is slightly better representation. So how, because that. We have seen in our user, it's troubleshooting. It becomes tough with uh, just right. looking at log file and also the searching, sorting, or things. Something you can do inside there. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Goes tonight. Work on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just want to add one point there that he said. It, for a long time ago, we added this extension point called console annotator that can drastically change the way the console output gets handled. If you look at the ant, for example, it comprehends the target and it creates a table of content on the left. So we haven't, and these guys haven't looked at that yet, but you know, I think that would be another interesting space to get to. Yeah, so it'd be, I think it'd be probably on the agenda at some point. Right. Yeah, and, and the UA teams that stuff I did that on the console was like 10 minutes work. I just broke out what was there and Change the colors a bit, and that was it. You know, I didn't, I didn't even look into the details of how the progressive logs and stuff like that work. So I can't, I can't really answer that more than what KK is. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is around the Jenkins UI and the jobs. Like I know you shouldn't default to all, 
but we do not. But if a, one of our clients like call and we have like hundreds of jobs, is there anything that you're planning to do with the UI in terms of like pagination or anything, lazy loading? It yeah. takes an awful long time. So, so pagination is kind of a universal problem, um, and the, the problem gets all the more significant if, as I'm advocating for, um, we start with a sort of global context for things and a, um, parse them down from there. Yeah. Uh, so what's the moral of the story? We, we see the pagination as being a, a significant issue. I certainly don't have a solution for it. Well, we have actually developed, a, there's a solution out there ready to go in for the build history. So I don't know if you noticed, some, some of the changes we made to the build history widget, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago maybe, uh, to kind of clean up the layout of the build history widget. It kind of aggravated a, a problem that was already there where basically if, if you've got a build history with say a thousand bills or whatever in it, loading that, loading that in all, in, if you hit the more button at the bottom and it loaded the thousand, it would, would like take forever. So one of the, I have a pull request kind of hanging out there for a good while that basically introduces the idea of pagination on the build history. So you basically, when you load it up, you get 30 or 40 whatever bills in it and you can page up and page down through those. It adds like filtering to it so you can say I only want to see bills that have failed in the last week or in the last month or between certain dates or that kind of thing. So it, but the moral of the story is that you're never, you're never actually loading over the wire more than a handful of, of um, a, a data for a handful of different bills. And the same, but the same basic principle could apply for any pagination of any data. Like you've got, you've, you've got a cursor. Where are you? Where are you in the? Like what page are you on in the data set? So uh, you have a cursor to that, and you basically say, I want to go up and, and or down from there, and that kind of thing. You know, so it's the same. Navigating the data should be pretty much the same uh, problem, and can be solved in a more, kind of a general way, I guess. I just have a comment. I created a very simple plugin a long time ago to deal with some UI stuff in the config page. And I'm really excited that you're going to kill it because this is so much better than you did not want me to create a UI element. So this is, this is awesome. So thanks. Yay, me. No problem. We done? So I'm not sure what category this goes in necessarily, if this is strictly UI, but I think it's probably related not enough. Um, as, as a developer, who would be writing code and uh, writing unit tests, I kind of would like to see, I would like to see the, the health of, the, of what I bring into my projects. So I'd like to see the number, of, the number of changes that I've committed that have then been tested, the overall uh, tests that are uh, succeeding, failing for my projects. I would like that somehow surfaced first. I don't know if there are plugins for this now yeah. or if this is something that can be necessarily uh, I guess brought up, or if there's been any sort of desire for this by others, but I, I suppose it would add, it would add, I guess, a better sense of my impact on the system. That's sort of how I see it. Is there any, uh, is there any sort of plan to get something like that or similar to that coming up in the future? So, uh, so if I'm reading you, you're right. You're saying what you what you really want is to have a. Uh, sort of user filter view of the world. So uh, your specific change sets, your specific uh, configuration changes. Um, so there isn't, I, we haven't specifically, or at least as far as I know, CloudBees hasn't specifically thought about users as a special attribute and as a, a special case. It's a great special case. It's a really good one. Um, but my hope would be that the first step anyway would be to getting, you know, as I was showing before, general searching and sort, sorting by attribute, user would be one of those attributes. So that would be a, a, a first generalized step. But I think you're absolutely right that specializing, you know, making it like a, a super first class entity, you know, what the user has done is, is really compelling. Well, was, that your, was that your question or more so when you log into Jenkins, you want to be able to control what you see when you get in? So, um, uh, well, to an extent, yes. It's a, it's a little bit of both. I would yeah. like, uh, I realize now this isn't so much of a question as it is a desire. Um, which, I, I would like it want. To, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, so I would like it to be more user oriented. I want, I want the, the developer, the user, uh, whoever's building stuff or testing stuff to, uh, to see what matters to them immediately. And that's, 
the, pr the projects that they work on, the ones that they immediately care about, that they have access to, uh, and the general uh, health or lack thereof of their contributions to those projects. And so I would somehow like that surfaced as, uh, as, as graphs, as metrics of these are the things that I am contributing. And then now here is my list of the projects that I work on. So do you mind if I ask uh, the group, does, it seem, does this seem compelling to everybody? Um, is there any? Yeah, yes. universally? Yes. With applause? Yes. All right.